Hello, and welcome to Clearer Thinking with Spencer Greenberg, the podcast about ideas that matter. I'm Josh Castle, the producer of the podcast, and I'm so glad you've joined us today. In this episode, Spencer speaks with Andy Matushak about spaced repetition, new media for information retention, creative insight, and research incentives and funding models. Andy, welcome. Really glad to have you on. Thanks, Spencer. I'm excited to chat. So we have so many interests in common, and I'm really excited to discuss some of the things that we overlap on. And one of those is on how do we accelerate learning, and in particular, space repetition. So do you want to just set that topic up for us a little bit, and then we'll kind of dig into some of the fun details? Sure, sure. Okay. So a really common experience that I have, and maybe that you have, is that I'll read a book that I found super interesting. Like I just read Religion Explained. And I was so fascinated by all of these theories about like why it is that people so consistently seem to believe in certain kinds of, say, rituals or certain kind of attributes of deities around the world. And the author had a bunch of theories about this. And then I'll try to bring these things up in discussion a few weeks later. And suddenly I'll find that, boy, I kind of can't remember any of the key details of this book at all anymore. I hate that experience. Someone's like, what's that book about? And you're like, uh, I think I remember one sentence or something. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And I mean, like, it, it sounds kind of silly. And it's true that, that in this particular instance, like maybe I don't, I don't actually need to remember the details of the author's arguments. But another thing that I'm doing right now is trying to develop my background in cognitive science much more seriously. And I'm digging into dozens of papers and trying to really deeply understand the experimental methods. And boy, do I really not want that effect to happen with those papers. I really actually want to remember exactly how those experiments were carried out. And so a thing that's very interesting is that cognitive scientists actually understand a great deal about how memories are formed. There are some fairly consistent patterns that describe those dynamics. And there's almost just a, an algorithm that you can do, a series of steps that will help you very reliably commit something to memory. It's just that standard behaviors when you're reading a book or talking to someone or doing normal work that doesn't necessarily carry out those steps. And um, space repetition is, is a way of doing that in a fairly systematic way, in, in particular, kind of instantiating those steps in software systems that help you carry those things out so that you know, maybe when you read that next book and, and try to discuss it at a party, you, you don't feel quite so flat-footed. One of the first blog posts I wrote for my blog was called something like, do we really read nonfiction to learn? Right. Because it's so silly because so many people spend so much time reading information that's not just entertainment, at least they don't think of it that way, right? It's one thing to read, you know, a wonderful fiction book that, you know, it's a, it's a great experience to read, but we read these like boring nonfiction things, right? Presumably because we want to learn. And then so few of us take the basic steps to actually like consolidate that learning. And so we forget, you know, almost all of it. And then we go read the next nonfiction book, whereas with just a little bit of investment, we could retain way more of it and it would just be dramatically more efficient. And that's where I see kind of space repetition coming in as part of the solution to that problem. Right. So I think one interesting question to ask is, you know, how cheap can memory become? So I think very sensibly, some people don't want to remember all the fine grained details from some random article they read on a Sunday morning, if it would be expensive to do so. But if it could cost you, say, 10% additional time on top of the reading time, then is it something you'd consider? Yeah, that just seems like such a good investment, right? Only an additional 10% to remember it instead of going and reading another article, which would double the time, right? That's right. And we don't necessarily have things as efficient as 10% right now. But it's not clear that we can't achieve that either. And the second thing that I wanted to point out is that when I discuss this problem of, of remembering books, many people ask the same question that you asked, namely, do people really read nonfiction to learn? But they ask that question and answer it in the negative. And they say, no, like, I'm not really trying to learn that kind of thing. And I think these people are not wrong. So a couple kinds of learning that I think are, are very useful uh, that can happen from nonfiction are, for instance, imbibing a set of cultural norms or values. You, you kind of get to see how a different mind engages with a problem. And maybe you aren't interested in the specific conclusions that that person comes up with. But uh, seeing their mindset, seeing their approach is fascinating. And one thing that I say when people bring these kinds of objections up, there's this kind of a, a space of, of things like this that aren't factual, 
but what you can imbibe from a book is that the same kinds of techniques which you can use to better absorb factual learning, you can also use to better absorb in these kind of semi-intangible things like increasing the salience of a particular idea or you know, imbibing values and norms. It's just not as obvious how to do it. Yeah, it's such a good point because when we say learn, right, well, maybe the thing you describe, this sort of intangible thing, maybe that is a form of learning. And people then will say, well, that has nothing to do with memorizing, which, you know, I think my experience is people immediately want to talk about memorizing and what it's useful for. But in a sense, all learning involves some form of memory, right? And then it's, it's sort of well, what form of memory are we talking about? Exactly. That specific point is something that has been very generative for me. When you start behaving in a different way, when you start understanding something that you didn't understand before that's, say, emotionally laden or conceptual, what exactly do you think has happened, if not memory? What other cause could there be? Now, I mean, it, it's true that perhaps for fight or flight responses, there may be different parts of your neurophysiology driving that. But for things like absorbing cultural norms and values and salience, things like this, these really are driven, I believe, by many of the same consolidation mechanisms, which allow you to, say, learn labels in organic chemistry. Yeah, I mean, it seems to me there really may be different memory mechanisms, as I think you're suggesting. One of them is kind of explicit knowledge, right? I think that's usually what people think about, like, oh, you know, I know the number of states in the United States or something like that, right? It's just like a fact that's very explicit. Then there's a sort of memory of a concept. It doesn't really feel the same in our minds, like the idea of philosophy or something like that. It doesn't feel mm -hmm. like knowing what philosophy is doesn't feel like knowing how many states there are. I don't know how to quite describe the difference. And then there seem to be still other types of memory. Like, for example, a chess master, in some sense, in their memory are all these patterns of like what boards look good. But it, it, that feels different still. Like that kind of memorized patterns just are, are sort of almost like the fast machine learning algorithm in their brain has been trained really well. Yeah, that's right. So the, the second category you mentioned, it's often called implicit memory, where you, you behave in a particular way that's influenced by memory, but you are not explicitly aware of the memory. This is in contrast to something where you try to remember like, oh, what's that person's name? You kind of strain for the moment and then somehow like the name bubbles up into your conscious awareness. This kind of implicit memory where, say, you learn these concepts about religion, and then next time you're talking with someone about religion, you interact with them in a different way because your understanding is different. Not because you're saying like, oh, this is like that one thing in the book, and I remember where the author said X, but rather just because your conception of that topic has been altered by your experience of reading the book. That alteration does seem memory-driven, and it's something that you can use this spaced repetition technique to drive. Yeah, and then that third type of memory, that sort of very implicit, you know, automatic pattern recognition kind of memory, people might be really skeptical that you could use sort of a system to train that. But, you know, imagine a set of flashcards where they had a whole bunch of like little mini chess problems on them, right? And you kind of get faster and faster at sort of identifying them. If you want to get really sophisticated, they could even be automatically generated, right? So you never see the same one, but you kind of have to immediately try to pick out, oh, what's the right move to make in this simple chess situation? And you can imagine that actually could train you to get better and better in that very intuitive sense. Absolutely. I think what you're, what you're referencing is this classic de Groot experiment where chess masters could be presented with a chessboard and then asked to reconstruct it on another adjacent chessboard. And they notice that the chess masters could do this with way fewer glances and way less time looking at the original chessboard as compared to novices. It, it was almost as if they had a, a more efficient encoding of the chessboard in their mind. They could hold more of it in their mind at once. And in particular, interviewing the chess masters, there were these very abstract concepts that came up that had to do with these representations, like lines of force. And so instead of thinking like, oh, queen is here, pawn is there, the chess masters see a board and say, ah, there's a line of force on this side of the board, and it has this particular color or valence to it. That's how they see the board. That's so cool. I was talking to someone who's a really long time martial artist, and they were telling me they kind of could see these lines of force in fighting, which I thought was super fascinating. And I don't know how literally to take it, but like they have this feeling that, oh, if I push the person in this certain way, they're going to fall over. You know what I mean? 
no, I definitely believe it. And my representations of, say, complex software systems are much more abstract and almost ineffable than they were years ago. Like when I'm thinking about how to architect something, there's these kind of box and arrow diagrams that start appearing in my head. And I almost have this notion that, you know, when I was a kid and I was learning to program, what I was contending with was syntax, like, oh, where exactly does a semicolon go? And then, you know, I got that down. And then kind of the unit level that I'd be thinking about was maybe the line, like, oh, you know, I'll try to figure out how to write a line that does this. And then I'll try to figure out how to write, write a line that does that. And then it moves up maybe to the function. And then finally to these like really large architectural elements. And that really does seem to be driven by a progressive consolidation of experiences and ideas. And as you alluded to, I think it's possible to accelerate that using memory augmentation systems. Great. So let's get really concrete here. Could you describe the approach to space repetition? How does it work and sort of how has that evolved over time? Sure. Yeah. So th there are two key ideas really in cognitive psychology that uh, enable these effective memory practices. And the first is this observation of the forgetting curve. So when you learn an idea for the first time, it seems to be the case that you will forget that idea over time according to a power law. So you'll, you'll like forget a whole lot of it in the first day and then less of it in the second day and so on. And so say that after you learn that thing for the first time, you come across it again. Well, now the second time that you see it, you're going to forget it a little more slowly and the third time a little more slowly than that. And you can, in fact, induce those second and third and fourth times and so on by testing yourself on that concept. So, you know, a day or two after learning, say, a vocabulary word for the first time, you can say, what is the Italian word for to run again? Okay, correre, great. And, you know, having come up with that, you will now remember it longer than you would after the first exposure. And so this implies that if you can kind of intermittently test yourself, on these pieces of information that you want to learn, then eventually the forgetting curve will slow down enough that you can retain it for a really very long time. And so the second key idea that makes this very, very efficient and not just very reliable is something called the, the spacing effect. So probably a, a lot of you have had this experience of there's a test coming up and you know you should study for it. And so you don't study for it. And you wait until the night before the test, and then you stay up all night and study really, really hard, and, and then you try to take the test. Uh, and, and this is called massed practice. So you're, you're kind of amassing your study. And it turns out that this is much, much less effective than if you were to take the same amount of time and spread it over the preceding week. So instead of studying for five hours the night before the test, you study for one hour each day. Your retention of that material will be much greater. And in particular, the, the optimal spacing seems to depend on kind of your rate of forgetting and how thoroughly you remember it in the first place and how long it's going to be until the next test and a couple other factors. When you combine those factors with the forgetting curve concept that I mentioned earlier, what you get is this exponential back off situation where in many cases, the optimal way to learn and retain something can be to you know look at it once and then a few days later, test your knowledge of that thing again, and then maybe a week later, do it again, and then maybe a month later, and then maybe a quarter later, until after you know maybe only four exposures, you only need to see this thing once a year. So for a total of maybe 10 to 15 seconds of practice time, you can really durably and reliably remember that item of information for a you know, year or years to come. Right, and it can be made even more efficient if based on how well you did on each review, you, you change the spacing, right? So if, if you know the content really well and you get it right, then you can make a longer delay. If you struggle to, to get it right, then maybe you make a faster delay. That's right. So it can be both personal to you based on like, oh, you're struggling to remember this thing. And so we're going to compress the schedule. And it can also be specific to the type of material. For instance, the system that you're using may be aware that this material is difficult to memorize based on many past student experiences, and so it may modify the schedule accordingly. Another important element here is this idea of active recall, right? Do you want to explain a little bit about what active recall is and why that matters? That's right. I, I only alluded to that when discussing the forgetting curve piece, but that, that is a really important element of this practice. And so it really harkens back to another 
school age mishap most people seem to engage in, which is say that that test is coming up and you want to prepare for it. The most common way that students study for tests is by rereading material. So they'll kind of like look through the textbook, look through their lecture notes for each page, kind of see, well, do I feel like I remember this stuff? Do I feel like I need to restudy? It turns out that this is not very effective. And there's a variety of other things that you might do, like writing summaries or highlighting. But one of the most effective things that you can do is what you called active recall and what's also often called retrieval practice, wherein basically you, you cause yourself to retrieve the piece of information from long-term memory. And so instead of simply rereading that the United States was founded in 1776, if you were to ask yourself the question, in what year was the United States founded? And answer, oh yeah, it was 1776. And the latter actually is much more effective. Right. And you need, of course, to be corrected if you got it wrong. Otherwise, you're just going to re-encode a false memory. But yeah. That's right. Although, although actually, there have been a number of studies that, that have suggested that even if you aren't corrected, retrieval practice may be more effective. It depends on just how unavailable the information is. But even attempting to retrieve it and failing uh, can be more effective than restudying. Oh, that's really interesting. Yeah. So one thing I find fascinating about this research is it just seems so different than the way school works. I mean, I don't know about your school, but my school seems like it's almost the opposite. It was like, you'd learn some material, you'd get tested on it, and then you just kind of just never touch it again. That's right. I mean, schools do, to their credit, often do something that they'll, they'll call like a, a spiral method, where there might be a test at the end of the week on that week's material. And that test might also include some stuff from the previous week and the previous month. And, you know, maybe three months prior, this is a relatively common practice, but you're right that typically these tests are kind of spot checks. And so students cram for the, the spot check and they do as well as they can do. And then because they did mass practice, they will now mostly forget that information and it mostly won't matter. And also they really struggle in many cases to learn certain things. Like many students trying to learn how to perform two-digit multiplication, for instance, there's kind of a straightforward algorithm that, that you can perform. And not that I really want people's understanding of this topic to be entirely algorithmic, but even just memorizing the steps to perform is something that seems to be beyond many students in our, in our current system. Yeah. And that seems like just a straightforward thing where like pretty much anyone could learn to memorize it, memorization technique, right? Yeah, exactly. I think this is a problem that, that could just be solved. And likewise, in chemistry class, when you're trying to learn all of these properties of, of various elements, I think that's just like, there's just a straightforward fix. I want to be clear that when I talk about this, the straightforward stuff, it really is just like simple memorization. Like, okay, you can learn your times tables more effectively. But the, the part I'm really excited about is using these techniques to learn more complex conceptual knowledge. Like, for instance, what exactly was the, the complex system of causes which caused World War I? And how do we think about that with respect to our understanding of historical causation in general? This is like a, often a part of history curricula. And it doesn't exactly seem memory-laden. Like there's certain facts that you need to learn, sure. But forming this, this more conceptual understanding of what is historical cause and effect and how do we think about that, it doesn't really seem like something that you can study with flashcards, but, but I argue that, that it is actually something that you can study with flashcards. There's a way of understanding how causes work. For instance, you want to look for effects which have no other good explanations for their causes other than a cause you're thinking about. Like That's one move that you want to play. And there's a variety of moves that you want to play when thinking about historical causation. These kinds of things can be practiced in the same way that you can practice a, a date I'm just delighted at the extent to which you and I are on the same page about <laughs> how much more powerful these ideas are than most people acknowledge. So I've been using a space repetition for, I don't know, eight years now, maybe. It's one that I just originally built for myself. I just used it for personal use to start. And I just want to read just, I, I'm just, this is just a total random selection of just cards in my flashcard system because I just want to give a taste to people of how different the usage of flashcards can be than what you might think it is. Great. So, okay, so just picking some random ones here. 
I literally just opened it up and picking it random. This one is on the links that have been found between people's philosophical views and their personalities. This is from a paper that I just read the other day by David Yaden. This is one on if you're doing an experiment, how should you control for the baseline values of people's attributes, like their age and gender and stuff? And what kind of effects does the method of controlling have on the result? This next one is on a theory I came up with about myself when I was working with a coach. This next one is on why are, do we have identities? And, and there's basically it's about how we, there are like four different reasons we have identities. This next one is on this interesting idea someone I know proposed about how we could change capital gains taxes to make them better for society and so on. So the reason I'm reading these is just like, these are rich concepts. These are not the sort of thing you think of putting on a flashcard. And yet having done this seven or eight years, to me, this is the best usage I found for a flashcard system is putting rich concepts that I want to like think about and try to deeply understand and that connect to lots yes. of other pieces of my knowledge. So yeah, I'm yes. curious if you have a reaction to the, like, the kind of things I just read. I love it. I can't wait to talk about these more. This is something that I think is really underappreciated, but also not all that well understood. And so when I'm talking about the cognitive psychology of retrieval practice and the spacing effect and forgetting curves, what all of those papers are testing are things like for instance, English to Swahili word pairs is a common choice. And that's very different from the questions that you just read. The kind of question that I find most useful in my day-to-day -day life is often much more about increasing the salience of a particular idea or about causing me to return to that idea again over time. I'll just give an example of the first that, that I wrote quite recently. I was in a conversation with a friend and she suggested that I might be making a particular kind of mistake in the way that I was interacting with people who were thinking about working with me, namely that it's sometimes hard to ask other people to do something for you, even if they're an employee and you're paying them, that you don't like doing yourself, like some really grungy programming thing. And she's like, that's just a failure mode. Like People like doing different things. And also, if they're kind of up and coming, you know, they might relish the opportunity to do this thing that you find quite grungy. And then even if they wouldn't, like your employee and you hired them for a reason. And so you, you need to not fall into that failure mode. And so I, I wrote the following space repetition prompt. What failure mode did that person suggest that I'm at risk of when working with other people? That's so useful, right? To be reminded of that? Yes. And it's not exactly clear to me the dynamics of how this kind of prompt work. So we could try to characterize you know, how well that idea is incorporated into my long-term memory in terms of like how accurately I can answer that question over time if you, if you ask me in exactly that way. But that's not really what you want. Like what you want is behavior change, right? Exactly. Like you want to behave differently in the world because of knowledge or information or, or change in your own neural network in your brain, right? Mm -hmm. And, you know, whether you even can say exactly what's on the back of the card, you know, if you're doing a flashcard, seems to me missing the point, right? Like, being able to say what's on the back of the card doesn't matter if it doesn't change your behavior in any way. And even if you can't say what's on the back of the card, but you sort of ha have somehow been altered by having been quizzed on that, that might be enough, right? That's right. And I'm really not sure of these dynamics. So I have found in my personal experience that writing these kinds of prompts does help me change my behavior. It probably doesn't use the same kinds of forgetting curves that are used for, say, the cards that I write about a neuroscience experiment. <laughs> uh, I don't know what curves are appropriate, and I'm not quite sure what kind of feedback system is appropriate to guide this system. They also don't always work, and I don't yet understand the situations in which they do or don't. I'm curious if you have anything that you've learned about that. Yeah, I think this is a remarkably underexplored topic. And actually, this might be a good segue to talk about your really cool project, Orbit. Do you want to say some things about that? Sure, thanks. Yeah, so this, this came out of a, a great collaboration I did with my friend Michael Nielsen. Former podcast guest, if you want to go check out his episode, which was really fun. Yeah. It was a great episode. And so he and I ha have both been very interested in, in space repetition. We, we noticed that not just have schools not adopted this system, but also kind of professional knowledge workers whose livelihood and success seem to depend on internalizing new material haven't adopted these kinds of systems. There are many potentially good reasons for this. There's lots of challenges to using these systems, but one of the challenges is that learning to write 
these prompts effectively, learning what kinds of things are good to write about and also learning how to write the prompts so as to create the correct effects is very difficult. And worse, that difficulty is not super apparent when you start doing it. And so most people who start working with these systems, they'll write really bad prompts for themselves and it won't even be clear that they're doing this. And so they'll just kind of give up. It doesn't really seem valuable. And so um, our suggested solution was, well, what if we can scaffold your understanding of how to write these good prompts by having an expert write them for you? And people have tried this kind of thing before. So for instance, like Quizlet is a very successful education technology company that works on the principle of kind of shared collections of prompts. But those often don't work very well because they feel kind of atomized, disconnected from any actual understanding of the material. You're trying to learn, say, quantum computing, and you download the stack, and it's like, what's a qubit? Like, how many dimensions are in the vector space of a qubit? And you look at this, and you're like, I don't know. It, it, it doesn't really seem connected with your understanding of the material. So we thought that we would maybe try to solve that problem, the problem of these, these kind of atomized and disconnected shared prompts, by interleaving the prompts into a rich prose narrative, like a really good explanation. And so that then you as the reader could have this experience of reading a prose explanation, and then every few minutes kind of pausing and having this chance to review what you just read using these memory techniques. But the prompts that you're reviewing are now grounded in the terminology and the metaphors and the narrative that you've just been introduced to. So he and I experimented with this in the context of a quantum computing textbook. That project is called Quantum Country, and uh, we, we learned a ton from it. it was- I highly recommend checking it out. It's, it's so cool. It's a wonderful introduction to quantum computation through this new medium. Well, thank you, Spencer. And We're still learning from it. But one thing that became clear really rapidly is that, well, different kinds of writing, different kinds of audiences, different kinds of contexts are going to need different kinds of interactions and and different ways of relating with this nascent medium that we call the mnemonic medium. And so I, I built a system called Orbit to kind of generalize these ideas from quantum country and to allow us to explore these notions in a broader range of contexts. One thing I like a, about what you're doing is it, it seems like a sort of never-ending research project where by releasing these different things out there in the world and then you know you get all the data coming back, you're able to actually learn new things about how memory works and how to best deploy these kind of memory aids. Right. I'm very excited about that. And that, that really is the, the kind of the driving force for the work. So there seems first off to be this possibility of a kind of translational cognitive science where there are these fairly well understood phenomena that we can maybe bring to more people by instantiating them in really compelling systems. And that in itself would be valuable. But one thing that I'm particularly excited about is this notion that the work may not just be translational and that actually these systems may help reveal elements of the way that we learn, the way that behavior change happens, which cannot be observed easily in, say, the context of laboratory experiments or uh, relatively limited academic systems. The questions actually need to be instantiated in big real-world systems that people are actually using in their lives. Right. I mean, this is a major challenge in general when people design these kind of cognitive science experiments and they want to control every variable for good reason because it allows them to actually study some phenomena. But then you can have this issue of generalizability, which is like, okay, so you got people to memorize French, you know, in an extremely controlled environment, but does that have much to do with the way people actually learn in the real world? And what would it look like to deploy these for people that are, you know, actually, you know, using it to learn the kind of information that doesn't fit neatly into the sort of standard structure? That's right. So I'll share, for instance, one learning that seems quite interesting so far. So there are, as I've mentioned, a lot of studies about how rapidly people forget, say, vocabulary word definitions or really just brute facts. And these are fairly pessimistic. People people forget such things really quite rapidly, even 24 hours later. Performance is often degraded by a third or half. But what we're seeing from quantum country actually looks quite different. And 
I think that that is due to the conceptual nature of the knowledge. So there are some brute facts in quantum country, like what is the numeric value of this quantum gate? But there are also just a lot of conceptual facts, like why does this need to be this way? Why is this relationship to that important? And the forgetting curves for these sets of information, these two sets of information look quite different and in an encouraging way. The conceptual information, people are able to retain much more easily than the brute factual information, which you'd kind of expect. But there's also an important mutually reinforcing element, or, or there appears to be from the data, where reviewing, say, card one or prompt one influences your memory of prompts two and three also. And one reason why this is exciting is that it might mean that when you're trying to use these memory systems with highly conceptual knowledge, you can actually be much, much more efficient in scheduling the, the subsequent reviews. And the cost, the time cost for maintaining the knowledge may be able to be driven down quite a lot. It's interesting because it's already like, sort of remarkably low, but if you can drive it down yes. another 50% or 70%, that's amazing. Yeah, well, we can talk about the time costs, actually. I mean, this, this is something that we've learned from quantum country that, that I haven't actually seen in the literature, but, but I, I think it's closer to something that a typical person would want to know. So a way I like to, like to think about this is if you go to a taqueria and you order a burrito, then you know it's okay, which kinds of rice do you want? What kind of beans do you want? What meat do you want? And then at the end, you know, there's maybe some add-ons. If you want some sour cream, for a dollar? Do you want some avocado for $2? So it's this you know, kind of bonus for your burrito that you can choose to add. I like to think about these memory systems in a similar way. Like, okay, you just spent four hours reading this introduction to quantum computation. Now, would you like to add remembering this information to your burrito? <laughs> uh, and, and what does that cost you? <laughs> in the case of the median quantum country reader, it costs them something like a one-third additional cost to durably remember this stuff for about six months following the initial reading. So it, it may end up being as much as, say, 50% additional cost to remember it for the, the first year. It'd be much lower in subsequent years. Right. So it'd be like 50% and then just like a little bit incremental on top for the you know year after that and even less for the year after that. That's right. Of. And so it, it takes most readers about four hours to read, uh, say, the, the first essay of Quantum Country. And so it's not super expensive to durably maintain memory of all the key information in that four-hour segment, but it's also not free. It's, it's something that's worth driving down, right? Well, it opens an interesting question of how much would they remember without the space repetition prompts? Because my, my intuition is they would remember very little of it, like less than 5% or something. But I'm curious if you're, what your intuition is on that. <laughs> right. Yeah, yeah. Well, in fact, we've, we've run some randomized controlled trials about this. Uh, oh, amazing. But I think they're I think they're not sufficiently controlled, or or else some interesting things are happening. So the best data we have on this is for a one month time frame, which is probably not long enough. But with a one month time frame experiment, the median reader forgot about a third of the material. Uh, now, because of the way that we ran this experiment, we didn't want to have selection effects for conscientiousness, basically. So we were choosing among readers who were still doing reviews regularly and conscientiously. We were just withholding some of the prompts from them. Uh, and this means there were, there were almost certainly interference effects where reviewing some of the prompts was reinforcing their memory for the prompts that we were testing. So, so probably they would forget a little more than a third. I see. That's tricky. Yeah. Uh, I'm running some more experiments now that, that should give us a, a somewhat clearer picture. And there is some prior information about medical students, actually, and, and how much medical students forget over time following learning. So medical students, after about one year, forget roughly a third of their, their basic science knowledge, and then roughly half by the end of the next year, this researcher Custer has found. So I'm a little bit confused about that, because it seems to me quite clear that like when someone reads a nonfiction book, if you were to then, six months later, quiz them on it, they would forget far more than one third of the material. In fact, that they would remember really a small percent. Am I wrong about that? No, I think you're probably right, but it may not matter. So let, let's talk about these med students. So they're forgetting something like a third of their basic science knowledge after a year, but 
that's different from the situation you just proposed, because these medical students are using some of that knowledge throughout the year. Some of their coursework will depend on the prior knowledge, and so they'll implicitly be performing retrieval practice in the course of the year. Perhaps their patient care even depends on some of that knowledge. And this, I think, is, is, a, is part of a, a pretty good criticism of spaced repetition and the whole aspiration that, that we've been talking about on this podcast so far, which is that, well, maybe it doesn't matter if you can't remember the details of Pascal Boyer's points from Religion Explained for your next cocktail party, because for the, the details that really do matter, they'll be naturally reinforced by your environment and by the activities that you perform authentically. You don't, you don't need this like inauthentic memory review stuff. I, I don't fully agree with this argument, uh, but I think it's it's partially true, uh, and and I think it's pretty interesting to take seriously. I guess the way that I think about this is there's a sweet spot of knowledge where these kinds of tools are most valuable, and the sweet spot is this would be useful in some way to you if you increase your memory, but you're not naturally going to remember it. And it's an interesting sweet spot because I think the vast majority of the things that we hear about we won't remember, but also it doesn't matter. Like they're not actually useful. You know, think about people read the news, like what percentage of that do you actually want to remember? It's probably really low, right? Right, right, and right. Even with, even with nonfiction books, it's not like you have to remember every anecdote or story. Like most of it's actually not that interesting to remember. But if you read like a good nonfiction book, maybe there's 12 really interesting ideas in it. And maybe each of those ideas has multiple parts to it. So maybe there's, you know, I don't know, I'm just making the numbers. Maybe there's like 30 actual pieces of information you might want to remember. So not 300, but maybe 30. And then maybe you actually remember four of them. You know what I mean? But like, it would actually benefit you to remember all 30. And so it's like trying to find those things that are not going to naturally come up automatically. So you're not going to be reminded of them. Because if you were, if you kept getting reminded of them, they, you would naturally remember them probably. So they're not going to immediately come up and, be, and you, know, you know, be refreshed. But you actually would benefit from, from knowing them. That's, that's sort of the trick, I think. Yeah, I think that's one class. And I can think of two more classes where there seems to be quite a strong argument for this stuff. One of them is the class where you need quite a lot of components to do anything. Like quantum computing is kind of a famously difficult subject. And one potential reason why it's so difficult is that in order to kind of understand any of the base layer ideas, you just need to internalize a lot of new terms and notations and concepts really quite quickly in order to say like, okay, here's your first quantum circuit. Like, let's talk about what it does. And so if you don't have some kind of memory support, you're left juggling a couple of dozen things in your working memory in order to try to understand the first interesting idea, which you just can't do. And that's maybe part of what makes the topic so difficult to learn. And that relates to, I think, the second class of issue, which is like a, a toned down version of that. Anyone who's tried to program has probably had the experience of writing their first program and constantly referring back to some reference for syntax details 10 times per line, referring to library reference for what, what's the name of this function, what's the order of its arguments, and so on, again and again and again. You, kinda, you can't really get going. This is very unpleasant to get started. And the same is true in conversation in a foreign language. Like it's, not, it's not pleasant to try to have a real conversation with a native speaker when you know five vocabulary words. So there's something about using these systems to get over the hump. Yeah, those are excellent points. Could the act of answering open-ended questions about yourself give you new, important insights? It turns out the answer is yes, if those questions are selected in just the right way. After running a series of five scientific studies, Clearer Thinking has discovered a specific set of practical, yet rarely asked questions that 83% of people reported were valuable for them to answer, and 78% said they would recommend to others. A remarkably high 88% of people even reported that they enjoyed answering these questions, and Clearer Thinking is now making those questions available to you for free on clearerthinking.org so that you can benefit from them as well. You can also order a beautiful physical card deck of the life-changing questions so that you can use the questions to bond with friends and family. We think you'll be surprised just how valuable answering these open-ended questions about yourself can be. To answer the free life-changing questions or to find Clearer Thinking's other free tools and mini-courses, head to clearerthinking.org.
I actually really want to dig in with you a bit about what is worth remembering, because I think that's just a, just a rich and interesting and important topic. And, you know, you think you've already started to hit on some examples, but maybe, maybe we could get a little bit more into it. And, you know, so one of the things I think about with this is that people will, will often say like, oh, well, you don't need to remember something because you could just look it up, right? We're, we're in the world of Google and Wikipedia. You know, what's the point of memory? And I think what that point of view gets right is that, yes, indeed, there are lots and lots of things that you don't need to remember because you can look them up. But what it gets wrong is it underestimates the extent to which we need ideas in order to have certain thoughts. So I'm curious to hear your, your kind of uh, analysis of that. Right. I think there, there are a few classes of things that are very interesting to try to memorize, even when you can look them up. So one of them is, is like these behavior change things we talked about earlier. You know, I had that conversation with this person who pointed out this interesting thing that I might be doing with employees, and I want to remember that key insight that she conveyed to me. I guess I could write that into my notes, and then you know, maybe if, if I searched for the right term, it would show up in my notes later, but that's not likely to change my behavior in the same way as being confronted with that prompt several times over time. Another angle here is that when creative insight happens and you make a creative connection between two ideas that no one has noticed before, or you notice a contradiction that suggests that something interesting might be hiding, you can't make that creative connection or notice that contradiction unless you have those items available to you in that moment. And then finally, I think that some of the examples I was mentioning earlier about trying to learn a complex topic or learning programming, there are these things where being forced to look up the material in the course of trying to do the activity makes the activity qualitatively different in a way that might be unenjoyable, so you won't do it. Yeah, all really good examples. You know, I think about this idea of fluidity of thought, right? Like, imagine that you're trying to do calculus, but you have to look up the definition of a derivative every time. Like, it just seems impossible. Like you need to get derivative down to the point where it's so fluid that you can just work with it. And it needs to be a building block that you can then attach to other building blocks and think about in sort of real time. Not all ideas are like that, but some are. I also just wanted to point out that even with the memory thing, you need to know that there's something worth looking up. And that actually is not necessarily obvious in all cases. Like, for example, you know, think about the Pythagorean theorem that, you know, a squared plus b squared equals c squared that a lot of people are forced to memorize. You don't really need to remember the Pythagorean theorem. It's just not going to really be that useful. But it might be useful to know that this this thing called the Pythagorean theorem that relates the, the sides of triangles to each other, right? And now that you know that, that you might be in a situation where you're like thinking about a triangle. Let's say you're planning, you know, something in your home, uh, you know, you're, you're, you're kind of designing a cabinet or something. And you're like, ah, the Pythagorean theorem. And suddenly, now you have the right hook into that information. Absolutely. And this is kind of a lighter form of memory that I think many people do with nonfiction books, where they read it not in order to remember the details, but in order to know, like, ah, there is a book that talks about this thing, and I will pull it down and look it up at this time. And so much of what we're talking about depends a great deal on the cost of memory. When people raise these hesitations, I think they're correct in the regime where memory is scarce or onerous or expensive. But they're incorrect in a regime where actually like just choosing to remember something is almost free. And so if we can move these systems along to get us closer and closer to that regime, then I think these questions become kind of irrelevant. Right. Like if memory could just be as simple as, you know, I choose to remember this, then suddenly we might want to remember a lot more than, than we currently think we do. That's right. And this relates to a, another issue that I think is, is worth talking about. I think many people are, are hesitant with regards to these systems or these ideas, because their experiences of memorization are grounded in these kind of industrial schooling environments, wherein they were being forced to memorize things that they didn't necessarily find interesting, or which were just structured by other people's agendas. And indeed, many of the tools on the market are kind of framed this way, where it's kind of, it's about other people's ideas. It's about what other people think are important. And this is a problem with quantum country too. Like quantum country helps you by giving the authors prompts, so you don't have to write them, but it doesn't give you any fluidity or flexibility with respect to those prompts for yourself. So something that I think is really important in the success of these systems, and which I'm slowly working to figure out how to do in my own 
mnemonic medium systems, is that the memory practice should be about you and the ideas that you find most interesting and meaningful, exciting. They should be framed in the way that's compelling to you relative to your experiences, uh, relative to stories that existed in your life. And uh, they shouldn't have any shred of a sense of like duty or like should schoolishness. Uh, it's, it's really just a tool for personal enablement. Hmm. So we've been talking for a while about space repetition, which is really an example of like applied cognitive science or applied psychology in the sort of learning space. So let's take a step back and just think more broadly about this like translational cognitive science or translational psychology. I'm just curious to hear your thoughts on this broader topic of how do you take results from these fields and then bring them to people in a way that, that benefits them? Because I think there's something that is in common between both of our work. Right. A lot of my thinking here is, is born out of writing from translational medicine, where this is a really essential practice. You have lab scientists understanding things about, say, molecular biology, and uh, eventually those insights making their way into drug development and, and hopefully into clinical treatments for, for patients. And that's a very pipeline model. A much more interesting model, translational medicine adopted, they, they, they call it kind of bench to bedside and back, where insights from the bedside can substantially influence the bench. Even in that model, it's kind of different people doing the two things. You have specialization, the, the, the clinical physicians are publishing a clinical report about their observations of this pharmacology, and maybe the molecular biologists read this and, and decide to run some lab experiments. I think uh, an underrated space, which might have some unique ideas or discoveries to be made, is one where a single person is potentially capable of reading the literature, using it to construct a, a high-fidelity system, one that wouldn't be tractable within the context of, of academia, and using that to learn something new, new cognitive science level insights, and ideally publishing and disseminating that knowledge back within that community as well. This seems really related to an idea that I sometimes talk about, which is, I call it full stack social science, making a metaphor with full stack software engineering, where a full stack software engineer, as, as I'm sure you're aware, works on you know, everything through the whole pipeline of an app from the backend databases all the way to the you know, front end user interface. And with full stack social science, I think about doing the full stack of things from coming up with hypotheses to designing and running studies to then taking those studies, translating their results into something in the real world, maybe building a product or adding features to a product, and then eventually pushing them out and actually getting them in front of users. It seems to me that there's just a lot of benefits to doing the full stack and that unfortunately, without the full stack, you can find there are a lot of gaps. Like maybe you find some really relevant academic studies, but there's some kind of bridge that needs to be made to actually put them in the real world. And, and with just the studies in the papers, you just can't quite apply them. And so unless you're willing to go do the study, you can't do it. Or maybe in developing a product, you come up with some really interesting hypothesis, but you know, if you don't have the right experimental design kind of methodology, you may not be able to test it appropriately and, and see if, if it actually holds water. I really love this metaphor. I think it's a place where your practice goes a step further than mine. I am interested in building real world systems because I think they allow us to see things about the theory which can't be seen in toy or demo systems. But I don't currently plan to take those systems and make them, say, products, companies which can be sustainable, have the staff that might be necessary to you know, really scale them up in the way that they could potentially be scaled. That's really just because I, I guess I feel something about like having my hands full. Like I don't know how to direct or coordinate or fundraise for that kind of work while also doing the kind of research work that needs to be done. Any attempts I've made that shade into that have felt overwhelming and unsuccessful. And so I, I'm curious how you think about going and, and dealing with that. Yeah. So it seems like you're doing more of the steps than is traditionally thought of as being part of like academia. And you're also doing it from outside of academia. So yeah, I mean, I, I think the, the entire spectrum would be like all the way from hypothesizing through to selling a product or something like that. But 
you're still doing these kind of like significant chunks that are more than is sort of expected in these domains, which I, which I think is really cool. And doing all the steps of sequence is not necessary. But I'll just say that I think it's really, really hard to do all the steps because essentially it means you have to try to develop these like quite unrelated expertises, right? Like designing an experiment doesn't have much to do with like building a product that people actually want to use, right? And, you know, analyzing data is, is yet another thing that's essential in, in your work and in my work that also has not, not very much to do with either of those other things. So it's really hard and there's huge challenges and it's stressful and difficult. And so I completely relate to not wanting to go there. Um, but I also think, you know, that can be really rewarding to try to bring it all the way from uh, hypothesis all the way to something that's put in front of people. So, and I, I really think you, you've done that, right? Like you, you have these essays out there that lots of people are reading and enjoying every day. So you haven't turned into a for-profit project, but you're still benefiting people who are getting the, the delight in the work you've done. Thanks. I appreciate that. I think you're right that one of the key barriers is the multivalent skill set. Certainly even developing the, the skill set to do what I can do at the relatively modest level I can do it has been challenging and is unusual. But I, I want to I push on that a little more because I feel that even within the skill set that I have, say the part of the spectrum I do is something like reading the literature, forming hypotheses, articulating some kind of concept based on those hypotheses, designing a system that expresses that concept, implementing it, shipping it, analyzing the results, and then like documenting and disseminating. There's a ton of stuff. <laughs> yeah. And, and like, so one problem with that stuff is skills, but another problem with that stuff is like just capacity. Like I, I, I feel unable to do all of those things at the level that I want to do them. For instance, when I am implementing the software, I find it very difficult to also think about the research level problems. Part of that is time, but I think actually people overrate the time component. It's much more about mindsets. Like I have to get myself into this mindset where I bring the system into my head and, and I'm implementing it. And when I'm in that mindset, it's very difficult for me to think about conceptual research problems. And the same is true for many of those other skills. Like they, they all have their own like hats that take time to put on and time to take off. I'm curious how you think about that. Yeah, it's a really interesting point because when you get really sucked into one type of thinking, it can be hard to move in and out of that. I mean, a big part of it is just team, right? Like you just, ideally you have a team and different team members are in different modes and thinking about different things, but you kind of cooperate across those boundaries, right? And I think that's a really good solution to this. Personally, I think my mind is pretty weird in that my preference is to be thinking about lots of different things and to move in and out from like, I don't write much code these days, but you know, like maybe I'm doing some coding maybe I'm talking to someone about data analysis. Maybe I'm then working on user experience and then, and you know, balancing between these things actually I find really wonderful. I, that's like my preferred week involves all these different modes of thinking and not kind of getting stuck in one. Right. And I know that you, you've like gathered a team as well to help you with this. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's, Absolutely essential. And I, I find it amazing how much you do uh, yourself. I mean, it's pretty, pretty astounding that you're able to do the whole process. I'm curious to hear more about how you think about working with this team, because of course, there are like financial limitations that keep me from expanding as much as I might like. But also, there are some interesting conceptual limitations. Like I find I can't just articulate the hypothesis and concept and then like farm out the design to someone else because the process of doing the design work substantially influences the concept. And the process of doing the actual technical implementation also does. And so these things are all intertwined in a way that I don't quite know how to disentangle. Like, it feels like they actually have to all be in my head. So I'm curious how you deal with that. <laughs> yeah, so a way that I deal with that is I try to be close to the design and other aspects, but close not as in doing the implementation myself, but rather looking at it very carefully as it progresses mm -hmm. and trying to also learn some of the insights that the person who's doing the object level work is learning as they do it. But I, so I think of it as like part of my job is like giving close critical feedback on what's being developed and sort of like considering, okay, here, here's the vision we're trying to get to. Here's what was executed. How is this different from the vision? How do we need to nudge it back? But I mean, I agree with you in that 
actually doing the work yourself can give insights, can give ideas. So maybe there's to some extent a trade-off between efficiency and getting your hands dirty. That's right. And maybe even more importantly, because it's an implication of efficiency scope or scale. Like I don't necessarily care about how long it might take to do something. Like I'm potentially willing to let it take, you know, two or four times as long if it allows me to reach some kind of outcome that couldn't be reached without it all being in one person's head. But then at the same time, like there are ideas that I just simply can't explore because they're, they're, they're impractical with the amount of velocity that I can generate. And so maybe those ideas, like you can't access whatever quality space requires everything being in one person's head for those ideas. Right. Well, I think a lot of people have a sort of different limitation, which is that it's just not feasible for them to learn that many different skills simultaneously. Sure, sure. Right. Like you're, you're having to do front end, back end, data science, research, you know, reading academic papers, designing experiments. Right, right. And it's like most people are going to be specialist in something. And then the other things like they have no, in some sense, they have no choice but to outsource a significant amount of it. Do you know what I mean? So. Yes. Um, while I think that there's this big benefit you get from doing all the things, like <laughs> that may not be feasible most of the time. There's another huge related trade-off, which is just that I am not as expert in all of those things as would potentially be a team of great people that could be assembled around them. And so you're kind of trading off the benefit on the one hand of having everything in one person's head, which allows you to reach certain points in the possibility space that are challenging to reach otherwise. And you're trading that against maybe deeper expertise in certain parts of the process that you could get if you dealt with people who made that their focus. That's absolutely right. And I wonder if you could get some of that benefit by just having people with each different expertise to scrutinize it. I don't know to what extent you kind of work that into your model of like... Yes, I try I try to, but I think <laughs> I need to do it more. And, and I think like one one place that could really help is, is involving not just scrutiny, but potentially even some, some active consulting. Like, you know, here I did a first pass of, for instance, this data analysis. My data analysis skills are fairly rudimentary. They're probably like, you know, second year grad student level or something. Can I bring you in to kind of bring this to the next level? I did that for Orbit's art direction, and that was super helpful. I, I don't have a lot of budget for this kind of thing, but you know, a few thousand dollars made a big difference in that place. If you're looking to test or improve your critical thinking, there's an engaging way to do so with clearerthinking.org. By integrating useful insights from psychology and economics into fun, interactive programs, clearerthinking.org helps you to make better decisions, create new habits, and achieve your goals. Whether you have just five minutes or an hour, you can use more than 30 interactive tools for free on their website. Try the rationality test, which tells you which of 16 reasoning styles best matches your thinking. Or the common misconceptions game to see if you are over or underconfident when you bet on what's fact or fiction. Clearer Thinking's work is based on scientific research about how to shift behavior in the real world. So check out their free tools and tests at clearerthinking.org. I would describe you as an example of someone who's in what you might call para-academia, which uh, Michael and I discussed on our podcast episode. So I'm curious, do you think of yourself that way? I do. I think I identify more with that than with like the tech industry or something like that. Hmm. How would you describe para-academia for those who didn't hear that other episode? Sure. I would describe it in terms of the what I'm trying to do. I am mostly interested in producing ideas rather than producing, say, like products, organizations, things like that. So like my primary output is figuring out ah, maybe a new kind of memory system can be constructed by interleaving these space repetition prompts with narrative prose in this way. And it has these properties rather than like a specific implementation of the memory system. So like that's the academic sense. The para sense comes from the fact that I'm not associated with an academic institution. I don't publish papers in refereed journals. And so I'm kind of a, like a weird outsider in, in these ways. And why? Why not hook yourself into academia in some way? Right. Uh, well, so I, I am hooked in, in in some ways. You know, I, I talk to academics in these areas pretty regularly. 
we've even done some collaborations. And uh, certainly I read a lot of the output of academics as well as of, of industry people. There's, there's kind of two main reasons. The first reason is, is something that we've discussed a fair amount or at least alluded to, namely that I'm trying to pursue the, the point in possibility space that involves taking these theories and building really fairly high fidelity systems that express these theories in order to try to understand them better. And that is an activity that is very difficult to do in an academic setting. It's discouraged by academic incentive systems. I have this intuition that if you were doing this in an academic setting, there'd be a lot of pressure to build a much crappier version of what you built, if that makes sense, because it would be really a research tool and not something that you expect real humans to use like outside of the research context. Do you agree with that? Yes, that's correct. And in many cases, it's the right call. It's the right way to answer the question they're trying to answer. I'm looking at a different set of questions. And I think for that set of questions, it really does require this, this kind of high fidelity implementation to, to understand. Right. And high fidelity also involves here, like people have to just use it because they find it cool, not because they're like being paid to participate in an experiment, right? Exactly. And so this, the second class of reasons really has to do with like the specifics of my field. And so if I were in a different field, I, I might be somewhat more inclined to try to make it work. And that, that just really comes from the fact that the field kind of most associated with my work is, is a field called human computer interaction. And the dominant cultural values and practices in that field, I don't enjoy. Uh, I think that would hinder my work. Uh, it, it's a field that's, that's very interested in trying to quantify and make empirical or scientific what I see as essentially a design science and the incentives and discussions in the field really reflect that. What do you think the problem is with trying to sort of quantify or make that scientific? Well, in some cases, it can be great. So like some classic discoveries of the field are, for instance, having a menu bar at the top of the screen is a great place to put the menu bar. Because if you ask people to try to, say, target a button that you place at the top of the screen, they can move their cursor up and then keep moving. So they don't have to be very precise about how far they have to move it up. And this means that they can more easily, rapidly, accurately target a button that's placed at the top of the screen. Oh, because it hits the top of the screen, you mean, and it stops the cursor? That's right. So that, that's an insight that, that came from this field decades ago. And it's like, that's a great insight. And it's an example of a, a quantitative insight that's really quite valuable. But a thing that I think is much less valuable is applying these kinds of methods to like here is a new way for people to collaborate on doing a literature review. I've developed a system wherein people like collectively synthesize using this new set of verbs. And so if, if that kind of paper were to appear in a human computer interaction journal, there would basically have to be some kind of study associated with it, where maybe they recruited some grad students and they asked some of them to like do a literature review. And then they came up with a bunch of measures, like how long it took them to do the literature review and you know, maybe the number of papers considered, rejected, cited, maybe they, they get some outside referees to decide on like the appropriateness of the papers included or not included. And all of this will be like kind of fine. Like it's kind of interesting to know this stuff, maybe. But for the most part, I think it just misses the point, which is like, does it substantially enable <laughs> the participants? It's like these really, really weak proxies constructed in a very inauthentic setting. Those two pieces together create quite a challenging setting. I see. So a lot of times the things that we most care about or the real true underlying purpose of the system is just hard to quantify. And so you end up with these not very relevant proxy measures, something like that. That's right. The nature of a design science is something where it's not descriptive. You're not trying to understand a particular physical phenomenon and characterize its dynamics, but rather you're trying to kind of create a new space of phenomena and say, what is possible? okay, here, I've created a new space of possibility. Let's try to understand its curves, its form. And some of the way that we can understand that, yes, is perhaps empirical, perhaps quantitative. But often the most interesting questions are like, what does this enable that was not previously enabled? So bringing it back to our earlier discussion, like what would be true in a world where memory was trivial and automatic? That's like a way more interesting question than how efficient is the memory system? I see. So pushing people towards these sort of measurable outcomes, which might in some cases be not the most interesting or important. I, as a mathematician, yeah, I love quantifying things. I'm also, you know, I'm sort of a data person too, not just pure math. So I love these kinds of things, but 
I also feel that it's just one set of tools and that the qualitative stuff can be as important and in some cases more important. Even just in question design, when, you know, if you're designing a survey, I find combining the sort of quantitative side, you know, what percentage of people said this with the qualitative side, well, what did people mean when they said this is, is absolutely essential and they, they both kind of build on each other. And it's kind of doing one at the expense of the other actually seems really risky because it might just be the wrong tool for the job. Right. And, and don't get me wrong. There, there are human computer interaction papers which do this and which don't have studies at all. It's, it's more that the dominant culture is, is one which is uh, kind of trying to be a descriptive science rather than design science. Right. So do you think more people should be doing peri-academia? And, and do you think that, like, that's, is that good for society? What, what are your thoughts on that? Right, right. So I think like the binary question, it's pretty easy to answer Yes. So maybe, maybe like more interesting is like a, a continuous question, like how many more people should be, or like if we had to move some kind of lever from academia, what's the carrying capacity of some kind of para-academic setting? Should there be tens of thousands of such people? Should there be hundreds of thousands of such people? We could talk about the, the funding constraints. And I think right now it would be very difficult for tens or hundreds of thousands of people to, to make that work. But I'd be curious to hear your thoughts on, you know, if we could snap our fingers and remove those funding constraints, how many projects or fields of investigation are there which would likely better be pursued in that setting? Mm. Well, I think you can kind of make an analogy to the free market where you've got your free market capitalism and that has certain problems that it creates like pollution. And then in those gaps, regulators can come in and they can solve those problems, at least in the ideal world. They can kind of fill these gaps in the sort of where, you know, cap capitalism falls on its face and causes all these issues. And it's sort of like one way to view para-academia is you can say, let's look at the academic system and then say, where are the gaps in that? Where are the things that academia is not doing as well as it should be doing? And then could it be patched with independent researchers that are pursuing these things freed from the constraints? And also, in some cases, weird incentive systems that may cause academia to, to miss important things. Right. So two, two general classes of kind of generators seem to be, first, these kind of translational things. Often it's fairly difficult to get commercial funding and to have commercial organization setups, which are reasonable for translational or even better, the kind of feedback loop oriented work that we were discussing earlier. And then a second generator that seems to be valuable is kind of totally out there, potentially paradigm shifting work where you, basically you're doing work that amounts to trying to define a new field that tends to be very difficult, at least in certain academic settings. Yeah, I think I'm very sympathetic to the idea that we want people trying radical things that will probably fail as long as they're doing it in a way that is sort of rigorous, if that makes sense. Like, you know, there's plenty of a kind of cranks, right? People that like don't understand physics that are trying to do physics, like, but they really don't understand it. And then you have a very small number of people that are really do understand physics quite well, and they're really doing working on radical ideas. And from my point of view, we should have like hundred or thousand of those, and most of those will not pan out. But that's where we'll get the really giant wins because you know every once in a while one of those will actually just radically improve the field. And I think I have a concern that in academia maybe it can be harder for that stuff to flourish. Maybe there can be a little bit of a winner take all dynamic where like one approach to something gets like a lot of the funding and then there's not that much funding for the more radical approaches. And then some approaches that might just seem too weird. Maybe nobody wants to study them because it's just not that cool. Whereas, you know, it's sort of freed from the system. Maybe, maybe people would pursue it. So yeah. Any reaction to that? Yeah, that seems right. And I guess I, again, it seems to come back to often the motivation being about escaping incentives so like maybe you can't get funding to do your weird investigation in an academic setting, either because it's difficult to get past referees and journals that would be necessary to, to kind of establish your credibility, or the results in this thing, or because the funding agencies won't, won't help you out. And so para-academia, I guess, for many people is a way of just opting out of that, seeking alternative funding sources, which may or may not be available. This is potentially separate from feeling crowded out intellectually. I don't know how many people feel that, but it, it may just be very difficult to develop some very unusual new idea if all of the discussion around you is framing the problems in some fairly well-understood way. 
and no one's really talking, interested in talking with you about your, your new framing. Yeah, I think, I think that's really interesting to consider. You know, I, I've always been interested in physics, but I've never pursued it as a career. Uh, so, you know, I don't, I don't know too much about it per se, but, it, you know, it strikes me that, like, if you want to make progress in physics, you want people who are really willing to reconsider assumptions that, like, nobody else is reconsidering because it's sort of like 20 years ago it was decided that this thing is true and nobody challenges it anymore, right? And it's like, probably there was some assumption that was wrong somewhere along the process. And, but, like, this stuff may be really hard to reconsider from within a paradigm where everyone just takes it as a given, right? Yeah. So are you familiar with uh, Garrett Lisi? Yeah. So I'm thinking, you know, Garrett Lisi has a, a new theory of physics he's pursuing. Eric Weinstein has a theory of physics he's pursuing. Uh, Stephen Wolfram has a new theory of physics he's pursuing. And I, I mean, I have no ability to evaluate these ideas, but I would like to see like a hundred of these, you know, blooming. And each of them, I think, is inherently a long shot, right? They're all trying to say, we're going to trade a new theory of physics that is going to kind of try to unify physics or do something that nobody's ever done. And so that's a huge long shot, but like, that's how startups work. You have a huge lo- bunch of long shots and occasionally you get a Google, right? Exactly. And I think like it has to, it has to be okay that many of these things will go nowhere. Often that's, that's difficult in a contemporary academic setting, but uh, you know, it's maybe possible for someone who can go off to Hawaii and you know, just kind of hide and think about abstract geometry all day. It could really lead to something interesting. It's something that, that's special about each of these people maybe not Wolfram, is that, you know, there really is just like one person that you need to think about this thing. Right. Like the budget of uh, funding someone to just th- think about physics is pretty low, right? Exactly. Now we should talk about some of the downsides too. Like non-association with an institution has its problems. I, I, c- certainly it promotes crankery, but uh, I, think, I think it also probably to some degree harms the dynamism of para-academic work. Well, I think a lot of people believe that it's very hard to do good work without others to bounce your ideas off of. And so that's maybe maybe a serious downside of not being in an academic system. Like, you know, if you're part of a department, you can just like walk around the corner and talk to world experts, right? And debate ideas and hear what they're thinking about and get inspired by by their, you know, lectures. That's probably pretty tough to reconstruct. You can do it to some extent. You can just befriend a bunch of brilliant people, but it certainly takes a lot more work out of the, outside the system. Yes, it, all, all of the kind of para-academic types that I'm aware of have had to construct something like that for themselves and kind of, you know, more or less successfully. I, I would say that the, the, the kind of intellectual exchange in my life is not as high quality as it would be in a good academic department. Uh, and that, that seems like a huge risk. It seems like really bad. and It's something I'm worried about and that I invest a fair amount of time thinking about. I have a, a weekly phone call with a brilliant friend of mine where we discuss psychology and each time we pick a topic. And so, you know, one week we'll do, you know, identity and another week we'll talk about anxiety. And I've, you know, I find that super fruitful having those kinds of relationships. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I'm so, so grateful for these, for these people. Another important problem seems to be our archival and dissemination. So for instance, at least Wolfram and I, and I'm not, I'm not sure about Weinstein and Lacey, but I think you too. Uh, we, we mostly publish in non-refereed, non-academic settings, right? The trade-offs are really amazing to me because I published some academic papers. Like I, I never pursued it as like a primary goal, but you know, I've published quite a handful of them. And the thing about it is I, I think to myself, hmm, should I go try to write this up for a journal, which will be a long, tedious write-up process? I have to learn... What are all the kind of like specifications of this particular journal? I probably have to do a bunch of research even to pick the journal in the first place. Right. It's going to take a lot of work. Then I'm going to submit it. I'm not going to hear back for a really long time. It's probably going to get rejected because, you know, most papers get rejected if, you, if you're applying to a good journal. Then I'm going to have to reformat it and like rework it a whole bunch to go submit to another journal. You know, like two years later, maybe it's going to get published. Okay, that's option A. Option B, we do a write-up for the Clear Thinking blog. We send it out in an email like a week later to 100,000 people. We release our uh, code and data. So if someone else wants to build on it, they can just go do that. They can just look at exactly what we collected and just reanalyze it or go do their own version using our code. And it's just like the trade-off is just insane. I mean, the, the benefit to cost between the two approaches, it's it just sort of mind-boggling to me. That's right. But the main thing that I worry about, enjoying all those benefits myself, 
is archival and connection to this, this broader system. So my citations are not picked up in the same way. My work usually, although it, I'm sort of slowly figuring this out, doesn't appear in like Google Scholar. I am uncertain that it will stick around correctly and as long as it should. The same archival stewardship is, is not there and so on and so forth. Can we just turn these into PDFs and then put them on like the archive? You know, is that is that a doable yeah, thing? Yeah, yeah. I mean, that, that's that's one approach. Although part of the reason why I self-publish is that often there's like interactive stuff in there. Yeah, yeah. There's really It's really hard to save interactive stuff for the future. So one of the interesting challenges for paracademia is, is also just like, where does the money come from? One really common answer seems to be people are independently wealthy. And that actually seems kind of okay. Like a lot of historic science <laughs> did happen that way, Gen gentlemen of, of leisure, so to speak. But something I've been experimenting with that's been pretty interesting is, is crowdfunding. Yeah. So have you done crowdfunding for some of your projects? Yeah. So um, the primary funding for my work comes from a, a Patreon and it supports me. It pays my expenses. It's not by any means lucrative, but uh, it, it is kind of interesting to compare the scale to a, a typical academic setting. So uh, if, I, if I were like a junior faculty in the sciences at a, a typical research university, a starter grant I would be pursuing is, is called the career grant from the NSF. And it, it provides yeah, relatively modest funding for about five years. And it's the, the most common grant given in these settings. And so the, the crowdfunding model now generates about two thirds of one of those grants. So, so we're, not, we're not all the way there, but it's something where it's starting to seem like maybe it can be comparable to this standard source of funding for, for new academics. That's really interesting. And I know, uh, for example, Guern, who does fascinating sort of handmade meta-analyses on interesting topics for his blog. I mean, he basically is, I think, f as far as I understand it, fully funded by his readers to just spend his time researching and writing, producing interesting output. That's right. Although his story actually concerns me a little bit. So uh, you, you can go and look at his, his Patreon numbers and they aren't nearly as appealing as mine, which I think is wrong because I think his work is, is much deeper and much more interesting. And he's also been edit much longer. And I, I think the difference is explained probably by two things. One is that he doesn't really talk about it very much, the fact that he has this model. Uh, and that's kind of unfortunate. Like every time I do talk about it, I feel a little bit like I'm shilling. It feels like it, it distorts or poisons the work. And then the second is that I think his work is less legible than mine, not because he's like a worse writer, he's a great writer, but rather it, like it's it's just weirder, it's further out there. Maybe the, maybe the you know, twenty thousand word analyses of a topic is not everyone's cup of tea. That's right, especially if it's a, a very obscure topic. And so one thing I'm concerned about is that crowdfunding may only be possible for comparatively more boring topics. Well, I don't know about that. I feel like you the stuff you're working on is 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 actually pretty cutting edge. And I, yeah, I, I think it's a really good sign that people are willing to fund your work. I mean, what do you think the motivation is? Like, why do you think people fund your work? Yeah, so I've done a survey on this. Uh, I did one in December, so it was re relatively recent, and, and about a third of people responded. So I don't know how representative this is, but of those people, the primary motivation seemed to be causing marginal production to happen. So I, I just give them an open-ended response. What, why, why do you support me? And the most common response was something along the lines of, I want more of this kind of stuff to exist. So implied in that is some theory that like by giving money, they cause more of it to happen. And that's probably true, right? I mean, it does free you from having to work in other ways to you know, make ends meet. Yeah, that's right. It's, it's like mostly true. I mean, there's some interesting asterisks at this point. My expenses are paid. And so what exactly happens with the marginal money? Well, at the moment, it's like, okay, well, my expenses are paid, but I can't really save. And that makes me nervous. And so, you know, if, if I'm feeling nervous, then maybe I will only do this for a couple of years because it doesn't feel long-term sustainable. So we're kind of getting over that at the moment. And then the next thing is staff, right? So now it's about accelerating the work. Right, right. Well, I certainly could see you using more money, like to have a assistant or have a programmer to work with, or, you know, that feels like a very high leverage, right? It'd be great. Yeah. And in fact, a few donors are helping me make that possible right now. And so uh, oh, awesome. listeners, if that's something that you might be uh, might be interested, you can reach out. <laughs> yeah. Where's the best uh, place for people to find your work and, and learn more about what you're doing right now? Sure. Yeah. Just at my website, andymatushak.org is a good start. I'm also fairly active on Twitter. Yeah. I definitely recommend following Andy on Twitter and 
If you can't spell his last name, don't worry. We'll, we'll have the link in the, in the show notes so you can find his website easily. <laughs> thanks, Spencer. Andy, thanks so much for coming on. This was really fun. Thank you, Spencer. I had a really great time. Thanks again for listening. If you have questions or comments, we'd love to hear from you. You can email us at clearerthinkingpodcast at gmail.com, or you can call and leave us a voicemail at 321-341-4669. To find out more about Spencer, visit spencergreenberg.com. To find out more about Andy, take a look at his bio in the show notes. And to find out more about our show, visit clearerthinkingpodcast.com. If you like the show, we hope you'll rate and review us wherever you get your podcasts, and we hope you'll tell your friends about us on social media. We also hope you'll subscribe to our email newsletter called One Helpful Idea. Each week, we'll send you one idea that we think is really valuable that you can read about in just 30 seconds, along with that week's new podcast episodes and an essay by Spencer. You can sign up for that newsletter on our website, clearerthinkingpodcast.com. Thanks, and we'll see you next time.